welcome everyone. Thanks for coming out this morning to hear about a terrific book by a terrific guy, my brother David. David and I thank Jean Brené, Pam Wormley, and the Skidelfa Library team for arranging this talk. The last time I was here, I was, I was honored to share the stage with Dala Vipkar. That was back in June 2012, and she's still painting away and, and working. I must admit that I get a great kick out of being part of this Chats with Champions series. Uh, today, David and I are championing a mountain called Katahdin and the artists who have responded to it in so many different ways. I also wanted to salute the Skidafa Library for recognizing the vital role of arts and literature that the arts and literature play in, in a community, in the life of a community. This community, with its many galleries and theater and historical societies, is a model for a kind of cultural economy if I can put on my main community foundation hat. <laughs> I know these organizations are more than amenities. Uh, they are the heart and soul of so many communities across Maine. Um, before I start, I, I, I just wanted to make a point to, to make sure everybody knows that there's a wonderful show of Nancy Freeman's work at the Round Top Center for the Arts. I, I went to the opening a couple of weeks ago. Uh, David and I have a, are longtime admirers of Nancy and her work. Um, a number of years ago, she invited David to curate an exhibition of our Uncle Bill, David Keenbush, which was really one of the highlights, I think, of our time in Maine. And she's done so many great shows and, and so much great work. And this is a, an exhibition of her own work, uh, and it's really quite remarkable. So please don't miss it. So a few words of inter introduction about the book. The Art of Katahdin had its origin in a campaign spearheaded by the Trust for Public Land to add Katahdin Lake and surrounding land to Baxter State Park. Partway through that successful endeavor, the Trust for Public Land decided to showcase the tradition of artists painting the lake. That idea led to a show and sale of contemporary Katahdin art, including paintings by David at the Portland Museum. It was at this time that my brother became truly Katahdin struck. He already had climbed and painted the mountain, but he entered a new zone of interest from which he has yet to fully recover. <laughs> he went on to co-curate an exhibition of Katahdin Lake paintings at the Bates College Museum of Art. That event and other Katahdin-related happenings eventually led to the book he'll be showcasing today. David put an incredible amount of work into this book, sacrificing his own art making to the rigors of research, tracking down permissions, finding the best high-res image, all of those things that go into, into putting together a, a real book. He had a lot of help along the way, but really, he took it upon himself to make Art of Katahdin what it came to be, a classic of the literature of Maine art. A number of people have asked us about what it was like to work on this project together as brothers. Um, the therapy is working well. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Uh, the process was a smooth and often exciting one. We had a no-nonsense deadline from Down East Books, which kept us moving. Each week or so, David would send me a new chapter by email, which I would download with keen anticipation for each piece of the story of the art of this mighty mountain offered revelations. Did, for example, did I know that John Marin had painted Katahdin? Had I ever heard the story of the discovery of Virgil Williams' masterpiece in the Colby College Museum of Art Collection? Did I even know that there was a Millinocket Art Society? One thing that truly sets this book apart, it was conceived by a painter. David's text reflects that special perspective. I followed David's vision, and he followed my suggestions for fine-tuning the text. There were some peaks and valleys, as there are in Baxter State Park, but we <clears throat> climbed on and managed to <laughs> summit uh, last April. Um, I did want to note that uh, David and I keep finding out new things related to Katahdin. For example, at our last presentation, I think it was in Ellsworth, someone mentioned that the poet Wallace Stevens made a reference to the mountain in his writing. Well, I googled it, and lo and behold, Stevens speaks of Katahdin in his 1944 essay, The, Big, the Figure of the Youth as Virile Poet. Of course, I knew that Stevens mentioned Monhegan, Pemaquid, and Damariscada in his poem, Variations on a Summer Day. He was inspired by a trip to Maine in 1939 to write the great line, 
Dammer Scotta, do, do, do. <laughs> Look it up. To get us in the mood for this morning's presentation, let me read the excerpt from Holman Day's famous poem from 1914, Kina Katata, that serves as the epigraph to the book. So if you can imagine, this is the birth being formed. When cosmos sh slowly from chaos grew, and mountains cooled in the seething brew of molten fires and gases that sputtered like nature's donut fat. First of the dumplings the good dame took on her testing fork to have a look was old Katahdin. She lifted it out of the steam of the bubbling pit, blew upon it, liked its style, studied the sample quite a while, made some figures on weight and girth, and proceeded to finish our good round earth. Thank you, Carl. That was fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> it is true that um, I also had a wonderful solo show here in Damariscata before I started, just a few comments that I was thinking of. I had a lovely show at the Round Top Center for the Art years ago, and also there was a wonderful show of uh, Jake Day's uh, paintings there as well, who I'm going to mention a few times in this talk. <coughs> Thank you, Jean, for inviting me to come, and Pat, I guess, is not here. Pam? Pam. Pam. Um, so we'll say thank you to her in her absence. Can you all hear me all right back there? It's okay? Well, good morning, and thank you all for coming to this talk. Um, I have just, like Carl did, a few a brief announcements. Um, the University of New England Art Gallery in Portland, the former Payson Gallery, is hosting an exhibition titled A Mountain Rise is the Art of Photography uh, to help launch the book. The exhibition has been extended a little bit. It's running until October 29th. There are 70 works on display many of them from the book and several surprises. And one of the great surprises is the recent gift to the Maine Historical Society of a watercolor painting of Katahdin by artist Maurice Day. It features a view of a mountain from Daisy Pond with an antlered box down, standing proudly in the foreground. And it has been in the Baxter family since it was given as a gift to Percival Baxter in 1967 on his 91st birthday. And note, please, that Percival that same year, on September 12th, appointed Maurice to the honorary post of artist in residence of Baxter State Park. Also, there will be two events in the gallery before the show closes. First, there's going to be a closing reception on Tuesday, October 15th at 5 p.m., which will be sort of low-key uh, for those that missed the opening, and it's a chance once again to celebrate the arts of Katahdin. Second, there will be a screening of Huey's brilliant film, Wilderness and Spirit, A Mountain Called Katahdin, on October 24th at 5 p.m. in the WCHP Lecture Hall of the Parker Pavilion um, at, at UNE. So please come to that. If, you, if you've never seen it, it's a, it's a terrific uh, movie, terrific film, and the music is, uh, was composed by Thomas Myron. It's one of the great contemporary pieces of music about the time. And finally, there's a little exhibit. I shouldn't say little. It's, it's, it's okay. I just, <laughs> but I'm a little, so. Um, that has recently opened at the Glickman Library at USM in Portland on the making of the book, Art of Katahdin. And here it is. This is the show is at the Glickman is about the making of this book. And it starts with a pitch letter that I wrote for Down East that, thank you, Carl, edited. So it sounded good and ends with the final product. And it takes you through the stages of what I went through as an artist, working basically intuitively and for the first time to try and figure out the process. That show runs until January 15th. Um, my talk tonight is designed around the idea of small, enticing taste of what's covered in this book. So I'll start. 
My obsession with all things Katahdin might be labeled research rapture. I think Carl's right. I have been Katahdin struck. What exactly is research rapture? It's a state of enthusiasm or exaltation arising from the exhaustive study of a topic or period of history. The delightful but dangerous condition of becoming repeatedly sidetracked and following intriguing threads of information or constantly searching for one more elusive fact. I know I have it bad because I've been in Catan Rapture for seven years and I'm still making fresh discoveries. Katahdin has been called Maine's greatest treasure, and for more than 150 years, the mountain has been a magnet for artists. This new book, Art of Katahdin, weaves a surprising and stunning tapestry of the region's artistic tradition and celebrates for the first time this overlooked aspect of the mountain's rich history. The artist of this bright cover image, Judy Taylor, who lives in West Tremont, presents the mountain in early spring, still wearing a crown of snow. At almost 30 by 40 inches, this work on paper brings the mountain up close at Millinocket Lake, increasing its scale and visual impact. And I, I might note right at the beginning of the talk that you're looking at a large, a large screen and that many of these paintings are intimate compared with the size you'll be seeing them at. So, if you could try to visualize, some of them are very small and some of them are fairly large. The theme here is the cultural and artistic legacy of the Native American peoples in the Katahdin region. Both Titian Ramsey Peel, whose work is at upper left, and James Eric Francis, almost two centuries apart, recorded an activity central to Native American culture, travel by water. James Eric Francis, in his painting at bottom right, his painting, that's a painting of the mountain from Compass Pond off the Golden Road. He's the tribal historian of the Penobscots, an expert on Indian place names, and an inveterate storyteller. Fred Toma, the master basket maker of the Maliseet tribe in Holton, whose work is at top right, is part of a multi-generational tradition, his Katahdin Arctic butterfly basket, which this one is not, this is called the Katahdin spirit basket, but his Arctic butterfly basket is in the collection of the Smithsonian. Dr. Augustus Cho Hamlin, the artist of these works, surprisingly, in later life, was both the mayor of Bangor and the Surgeon General of Maine. The nephew of Hannibal Hamlin, President Lincoln's first vice president, Hamlin trained to be a surgeon and studied art. His small painting of Katahdin from a private collection in Utah may be dated to mid-19th century. From a stamp on the back, we know the painting was once owned by the Bangor and Portland Railroad and may have been a commissioned work it was done to promote the railroad. Hamlin exhibited a Katahdin painting at the National Academy of Design in 1859. In 1880, Hamlin purchased Mount Mica in Paris and began mining tourmaline. And he got that from his father and his uh, uncle who had been finding tourmaline and in this area. And eventually, um, his son, Augustus Cho purchased Mount Mica. The necklace you see at the right is of main tourmaline, and that is Hamlin's design. In the late 1890s, Hamlin, then in his 70s, envisioned the creation of a game preserve at Mount Katahdin. Myron Avery was, quote, the driving force behind the creation not only of the Appalachian Trail in Maine, but also of much of the rest of the trail, writes David Field. Avery also founded the Appalachian Trail Club, the main Appalachian Trail Club, in 1935. But less known were his interests in the early photographers and artists of the region. His article, Artists and Katahdin, from the 1940 magazine In the Maine Woods, is one of the earliest essays on the Katahdin area works of artists Frederick Church and George Hallowell. 
In the, in the article, Avery writes this, the story left by these artists is extremely fragmentary. A painting here and there, a chance reference in some forgotten book or article, photographs hidden away for half a century. Not anymore. <laughs> Alongside the article is a photo of Avery with his measuring wheel. which was used to measure the trail across the top of Katahdin. Avery wrote that, quote, the measuring wheel triumphed over all obstacles, even over the sheer pitch of the chimney. But he admitted that its predecessor had come to grief in crossing the knife edge. And above this photo is a large oil painting by George Hallowell from Avery's art collection titled, Logging in the North Woods with Snow-Covered Katahdin in the background. Avery once wrote, from each cardinal direction, Katahdin's aspect is utterly different, noting that it is not one, but many mountains. Here's a bit of backstory. I traveled by van, my studio on wheels, from Portland to Millinocket, Patton, Shin Pond, and beyond up to Island Falls and Smyrna to explore, to paint, draw, photograph, keep a journal. I also purchased postcards and other memorabilia. My curiosity grew with every trip. I wanted to know about the profiles I was looking at, especially the foreshortened views of the mountain, the names of the peaks, their history, description, and height. This led to an interest in the cards themselves, the photographer, the publisher, the printing process, and often the personal note written on the back. And it led me to guidebooks, magazine articles, and maps, to collecting and doing research. I was hooked. I had early symptoms of research rapture. <laughs> Counterclockwise from upper left, profiles of the mountain, traveling from the west branch of the Penobscot River at the height of land, to Katahdin Stream Campground in the park in the middle, down to Abel Bridge off the Golden Road, and then over to the Millinocket area, and on to Katahdin Lake, which is now in the park, and finally up to Stacyville and Patton off Route 11. This eastward and northward path displays the spectacular silhouettes of Katahdin and underscores the challenges and allure for the artist. Note that these postcards might be today's email, tweet, or photo sharing. <coughs> this detail from a map demonstrates the activities of artists at Katahdin, <coughs> setting up easels, taking photographs, writing journals, and stories. Let's imagine for a moment adding a few other artists to this mix. Why, there's Alan Havanis as a young man climbing Katahdin with his father. At the age of 76 in 1987, the celebrated American composer would write an intimate four-movement sonata for piano titled Mount Katahdin. And there's Kathleen Ellis flying high around the mountain in a small Cessna. She was inspired to write a large, multi-dimensional poem circling Katahdin, also in the 1980s. And finally, there's Jacques D'Amboise, a principal dancer with the New York City Ballet, halfway up the Hunt Trail in Baxter State Park. He's choreographing a new work, a short jig called Trail Dance, a true flowering of arts. One could go on and on. There are so many examples of people being inspired and creative in the Katahdin region. Much like the postcards and illustrations of Katahdin, this painting advertises adventure, tranquility, and scenic splendor. The artist Virgil Williams learned photography from Carlton Watkins while on a trip to Yosemite. In this iconic painting, 
of the mountain from the mouth of Abol Stream. Williams uses the photos and sketches he made at Katahdin in 1870, placing you, the viewer, in your canoe with your canine companion in late afternoon light, tempting you to come and see for yourself the wonders of the North Woods. The story of its discovery, is, as Carl mentioned, which is retold in my book, reads like a detective story. The painting is currently on view at the Colby College Museum of Art as part of the new Lunar Wing celebration this year. Gail Davidson, senior curator of prints and drawings at Cooper Hewitt in New York, said that once he discovered Katahdin, quote, Frederick Church never looked elsewhere in the United States for primeval content. One of Church's companions on the infamous 1877 Katahdin Tea Party trip, and I have to say that I've called it infamous because they had so much fun, they referred to it as a tea party trip, <laughs> was the writer A.L. Holly. Holly penned the famous line, few views of mountains in any country exceed that from the southern shore of Lake Katahdin in combined grandeur and beauty. It must have been quite a surprise for Church's friends to come out of the woods of the lake and see what has been suggested by many to be the finest view of the mountain from anywhere. Not to mention the sight of Alpenglow in early morning. Church painted this canvas in his New York studio over the winter from sketches he made there and sold it to A.L. Holly. Staying with Church a moment, Frederick Church was what you might call the artist in residence at Katahdin from 1878 to 1895. This fragile oil study at the top is dated 1878, the year he purchased a 50-acre property on Millinocket Lake for $100. It's one of the many handsome studies he made of his Katahdin view from what he called Camp Rodora. Today, the artist Evelyn Dunphy teaches art classes at the former church property, inspired by his legacy. The artist Jervis McEntee painted Camp at Millinocket Lake at bottom the following year while staying at Frederick Church's newly built camp. When finished, the painting was given to church in exchange for travel expenses to Millinocket Lake the year before. Church admired the work and hung the painting at Olana, his grand home in Hudson, New York, where it still hangs today. Seated at left in the painting, wearing a blue hat, is Isabel Church, the wife of the artist. Seated at right might be Sanford Gifford, and standing at right is Gifford's sister Mary. Look at those accommodations, how <laughs> rustic. That was, that's the way it was during the construction phase. They had put a blanket up between the women and men's quarters, which you can sort of see in the opening. But it was in the process of being built. I might also say here that we know the names of these sitters and the date of the sketch, which you don't see on the painting. It's unsigned and undated. Because McEntee mentions them in his daily diary entries from the trip as he writes about the painting in progress. To reach this vantage point, the artist Charles Benjamin, I shouldn't say the artist, he, was, he did a lot of different things, but in this case, a patent native, climbed up onto Mount Chase and Shin Pond, set up his paint box, and selected a view of the Katahdin Range looking southwest. It's dated August 14, 1895. In his book about the history of Patton, titled A Hill Town in New England, 1929, Benjamin describes the view from Patton. Here's what he wrote. On the western horizon, 25 miles away as the crow flies, rises the jagged summit of Pomola. Its sides cleft by ravines, purple outlines in summer against the pale blue of the mountain, in winter dazzling stripes of drifted snow. To the child as he arose in the spring morning, the clear outlines of this noble mountain with its faint shadings of blue and violet seemed like a gateway to some wonderful domain, the, the abode of fairies and good angels. 
This painting is quite small, and it's included in the Portland exhibit. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, wood engravings were made from plein air drawings, paintings, photographs, and written descriptions of the Katahdin region. As illustrations, they were suggested and often enhanced, like travel ads, enticing you to go there and experience the sights and sounds of the forested landscape. Counterclockwise from upper left, these engravers, largely unknown today, are Samuel Kilburn, True Williams, at bottom left, G.T. Devereaux, over here on the right, and Jacob Bates Abbott, up above. At upper left, the engraving was made from Frederick Church's painting of Catan from Ribogenus Lake and published in Theodore Winthrop's Life in the Open Air, 1863. Below it, the engraving was made from T.S. Steele's wet plate photograph of the Hulling Machine Falls on the east branch of the Penobscot River and published in his popular guidebook, Canoe and Camera, 1880. At bottom right, the engraving of the view of Mount Chase from the top of Sugarloaf Mountain, and that's not the Sugarloaf that's up by Rangeley, it's really the, the, it's a smaller mountain that also has the name Sugarloaf, was made from C.T. Jackson's graphite drawing when he was on top of Sugarloaf and published in his second annual report on the geology of the public lands, published in 1838. And finally, above on the right, is a woodcut made from one of the author, one of author Charles Asbury Stevens' descriptive scenes in his children's adventure story, Katahdin Camps, 1928. All four of these indirectly suggest the advent of tourism to this unspoiled part of the state. With this next image, we move into the 20th century. Boston artist George Hallowell documented the activities of the woodcutters and river drivers with his brush and camera in the century's first two decades. Hall Hallowell often took photographs as reference material for his studio work and then used artistic license to increase the dramatic effect. Notice here the Corcoran Gallery's painting and backdrop of the Wasatacook River <coughs> Drive in springtime, as you can see in the photograph, has been changed by the artist to depict the aftermath of the Great Fire of June 1903, in which 84,000 acres burned, one of the worst forest fires in Maine history. Note also that the Kodak Company produced its first camera in 1881, when Hallowell was 10 years old. There's a, there's a wonderful portrait, uh, a little photograph in the library, the Maine State Library, of him holding his Kodak box camera as a young man. Lewiston native and modernist painter Marston Hartley wrote the following lines, dated October 22, 1939, to a friend upon his return from a nine-day stay at Cobb's Camps on Katahdin Lake. Here's what Hartley wrote. Came back from Mount Katahdin, our sacred mountain of Maine. Wonderful but exhausting experience. Physical hardships. But I know now my own beloved Maine as I've never known it before, and I shall immortalize that mountain as no one has or likely will, as it is my mountain, and I the official portraitist of it. <laughs> and in another letter, he wrote, and nature even staged a beauteous snowstorm, covering everything with velvet and soothing white. It was superb, really. This oil on board, it's much smaller than this, it's 22 by 28, was painted in his Bangor studio, a third floor front room in the home of his good friend and fellow artist, Waldo Pierce. This also was a small watercolor. It's not nowhere near this big, but it's pretty spectacular. Stanley Woodward, an artist well known for his marine paintings, of breaking waves along New England's rocky coasts, has rendered a tranquil moment at Kidney Pond in the park, with its range of mountains, 
West Peak, OJI, and Mount Co. west of Katahdin. It stayed in 1950. It brought to mind the thoughts of another traveler to the region, Henry David Thoreau. Here's Thoreau. Standing on the shore, I once more cast my line into the stream and found the dream to be real and the fable true. The speckled trout and silvery roach, like flying fish, sped swiftly through the moonlight air, describing bright arcs on the dark side of Katahdin, until moonlight, now fading into daylight, brought satiety to my mind and the minds of my companions who had joined me. That's from his first published account, Katahdin, 1848. But you said you were in the 20th century. Okay. We're back to the 20th century. 20 years ago, my painting buddy, Chris Huntington, invited me to join him for dinner at the home of Dr. Edward Martin in Rumford. Chris had purchased this painting of the Hunt Mountains on the east branch of the Penobscot River, directly from the artist Carl Springhorn, and subsequently sold it to Dr. Martin. It was my first encounter with a Springhorn painting. And for me, the strong color and calligraphic brushwork did, it blew me away. Look at the energy and the detail I've pulled out. The strong gestural brushwork. Springhorn worked in the Patton Shin Pond area, east of Katahdin, on and off from 1937 to 1952. Flying around the mountain in a float plane can be a tricky business, much less trying to find an opening in the thick mantle of clouds. For the solitary artist James Fitzgerald, who didn't use a camera, but preferred to work from memory and quick sketches. This evocation of the mountain was well worth his pilot's efforts. But sometimes the artist grew impatient. Clarence Hilliard, owner of the Katahdin Lake camps, told me at the time the painter was standing on the beach at the lake, arms folded, totally absorbed in study of the mountain, when a group of hunters approached and asked politely for directions to the lodge. Fitzgerald responded with a loud, don't bother me, I'm busy. Can't you see I'm working? <laughs> Maurice Day, known to his friends as Jake, a Damaris Gata native, whose many talents including, included illustration, carving, and fine art, made 21 trips to the Katahdin region, beginning in 1933 and ending in the mid-50s. These exploits are recorded in the book Katahdin Comrades, the journals of his hiking buddy, Lester Hall. Later trips to the region were made by an informal group of Damariscotta businessmen known as Jake's Rangers, formed in the late 50s with Jake as the self-proclaimed colonel. <clears throat> Day's watercolor here, Wilderness Rescue, makes light of a wildlife rescue following a difficult snowshoe trip to South Branch Campground in the park. Jake liked to tease his buddies and play pranks on them. As the painting suggests, the two rangers, Ed Pierce in front and Bentley Glidden behind, <coughs> might not have made it home without a little help from their friends. <laughs> There are many interconnected threads in these four images. The friendship of artists, writers, and guides. A snowshoe trip along the East Branch with sketching that included a stopover at the Bolin camps. And the legacy of an earlier vacationist, Henry David Thoreau. The painting by Maurice Day of the Bolin camps, the watercolor, was made in March 1935 the year that Day and his son Mac and Lester Hall snowshoed 75 miles over to the East Branch and back via the Bolin camps from Shin Pond with Caleb Scribner acting as their guide. 
the Ford Times article about Thoreau's summer travels, written by Edmund Ware Smith, is from 1959, and curiously, illust illustrated illustrations of Jake's winter paintings from that trip are, are in that article. The book of Todd and Conrad's, the Journals of Lester Hall, published in 2010, recounts the actual trip itself in great detail. What started all of this was that I saw the painting at the Bowman camps when I stayed there um, in 1994 while I was on a spring painting trip. So I remembered it. And then later I saw the article in the Patton Library in the Ford Times, and I made a note of that. But when this book came out recently, it put it all together. Cecil Palmer, born in Fort Fairfield, Maine in 1893, is a terrific example of an unknown and, un and unrecognized artist that, like Jake Day and Lester Hall, spent many years camping and tramping, painting and writing in the Katahdin region. The book Art of Katahdin introduces his work for the first time to a broader audience. Contrast these two views and mediums. Perhaps the most popular place in the park, the South Basin and Chimney Pond, done in pen and ink, with one of the least visited and least accessible, Klondike Pond, done in watercolor. Three of his works are included in the Portland exhibition if you come down to see it. And they're very intimate, they're very small works. Note that Palmer developed, much as the artist Charles Hubbard had, a distinctive and personal pen and ink style, all his own. Note also that Ludwig Moorhead wrote in 1922 that, quote, the name Klondike was given by an old Indian trapper who had been to Alaska. He honored the remote pond with his name because in his opinion, it was the wildest part of the Katahdin country. The artist Vincent Harkin wrote that to capture nature's fluctuating colors and forms, quote, I have developed a semi-abstract approach, which is neither realistic nor repertorial, but which accepts change as the predominating value in the face of nature. Here, Harkin attempts to suggest the delicate colors and forms of mosses, ferns, and lichens set into a cliff face at Katahdin. It is titled Katahdin Crevice and was painted five years after his ascent of the mountain in 1960. This watercolor and Jake Day's Wilderness Rescue that I previously showed are both on view in Portland. The Art of Katahdin features a remarkable array of interpretations of the region's many motifs including this work by friendship-based painter Sam Cady. Here, Cady stretches the boundaries between painting and sculpture. I should say no pun intended, because it is a stretch canvas. <laughs> Illusion and reality. His construction of this funnel-shaped canvas at six by five feet accentuates the downward plunge into the South Basin from the knife edge. It's the centerpiece of the Portland show as you walk in. On the second floor of the Portland show is another daring interpretation of Katahdin by artist Scott Balls, this time of its southward projecting massif. The scale and presence of the mountain, with its geometric patterns jazzed up, is tightly controlled, suggesting, as Scott mentions in his artist statement, the volatile energy and movement within the landscape. This painting was featured in the August issue of Down East magazine. This mural-sized work by former Penobscot chief Barry Dana celebrates the four seasons at Katahdin. It includes, in the words of the Penobscot prayer, Mizindul na bemulk, all my relations. 
ancestors, bears, wolves, all winged birds, trees, rocks, rivers, mountains. For the, for the four tribes of the Abenaki, Katahdin is the dwelling place of the Great Spirit, a sacred place. This one is fairly large. It's four by eight feet. And it's at Indian Island. Here, Kingfield artist Ronald Parlin has tackled a challenging subject from an unusual perspective, an underwater feast. The book, Art of Katahdin, features a number of images of flora and fauna of the region. This one is a fairly good sized painting, but not quite that big. The subject of this colorful abstraction by Susan Siegel is Bell Pond in Baxter State Park, located about seven miles from Roaring Brook Campground. This watercolor, with its bright color palette and feeling of wind and light, was chosen for the invitation card for the show. Can you tell I'm promoting the show in Portland? <laughs> Pretty breathtaking. This is a large, large painting, but not quite this big, but about that size. One of the many outstanding scenic spots along the Appalachian Trail is Little Niagara Falls on the Salvaho Stream, portrayed in this large photorealistic canvas by West Sumner artist Joel Babb. <laughs> I saw this print by artist and Appalachian Trail through hiker Postcard Hughes at the Appalachian Trail Cafe in Millinocket. I wrote to Postcard asking for permission to publish. Postcard wrote back this. By the time northbound through hikers reach Baxter State Park and Katahdin Stream Campground, most of our big toes are 40 to 60 percent numb. <laughs> Yards of duct tape have wrapped our most tender foot regions just to provide enough armor so we might continue to make miles. Check out that right hand corner. Don't you love the lightning bolts coming out of the game? <laughs> Hughes continues. Reaching Baxter and seeing Mount Katahdin from Abel Bridge as we exit the 100 mile wilderness leaves us silent, giddy, and floating on adrenaline all at the same time. As big as the ascent of Mount Katahdin is, it is a day without complication and uncertainty, unlike those early days down in Georgia. The last 5.2 miles up to Baxter Peak and that weather-beaten sign called Katahdin hold a purity. The history of photography at Katahdin and the many subjects of this wilderness area deserve a closer look than I was able to give in the book, especially the large and talented contemporary group. But a carefully selected photographic history of Baxter State Park in Katahdin has recently been published in an Images of America series by authors and historians John Neff and Howard Whitcomb. And Howard is here today, so if you want to talk to him about his book after. He also is, has been one of my mentors on the creation of this book. The black and white photographs in their book were cleaned up, processed, and formatted at high resolution by Bill Bentley, the photographer who captured here at bottom left a winter sunrise at Chimney Pond. Bill, a talented photographer himself, also helped me format and process all of the many images in my book. Next to it on the right is a very dramatic shot of a lone skier, Ken Spaulding, at Katahdin Lake, taken by Associated Press photographer Bob Ducati. The photo at upper right is by Bert Call, an early staff photographer for the Bangor and Rustics publication in the Maine Woods. Here, his photo was used to illustrate the children's book, Boy Scouts on Katahdin, 1924, by New York theater critic Walter Pritchard Eaton, 
In the story, one of the Boy Scouts says that the knife edge looked, quote, as if a gigantic dump cart had driven along loaded with millions of hunks of granite and dumped them off. <laughs> and the small photo at top left is from an album titled Katahdin 1924 that chronicles the trip my grandfather took to the summit of Katahdin from New York City with his Princeton chums in 1924. I would like to conclude my talk with excerpts of two letters written by my uncle, our uncle, William Kingbush, of his trips to Katahdin. First, his letter of 19, his first, his letter of June 16, 1948. Bill, at 36 years of age, starts his letter recounting a visit by car to Nova Scotia with his artist buddy Hyde Solomon and their move to Millinocket in the mountain. Three and a half hours by ferry across the Bay of Fundy. Next day, rain. Drove to Callis, and from there to Millinocket. Stayed for two and a half days at Millinocket Lake at a camp. We each had a small log cabin, and spent most of the time keeping our respective stoves operating. <laughs> then commenced the assault on Katahdin. The previous day we had seen Katahdin from a distance, like a great black wave at its peak, about to break over the landscape. Wednesday. It rained, but we drove the dirt road, almost to where the trail commenced. The road was terrible. Almost got stuck twice. Finally, it rained so hard we returned, defeated. Thursday. Still raining, not so hard. Decided to try again. Drove the road successfully. I, by now knowing every bump and hill and shoulder. At Avalanche Meadow, we could see Katahdin suddenly rear up, black triangles, powdered with black and white snow, the fog eddying up and down and across the ridges. Reached the trail, started to climb. Provisions, matches, two sandwiches per, two Milky Way bars per, and one roll of wet toilet paper. <laughs> the trail led up a boulder-scattered stream bed. This is Roaring Brook. Through the birches we could see a rain-swollen stream and hear its roar as it swerved and hit and swerved and sluiced its way across the smooth rocks. After one and a half miles we came out on a plateau and looked back down into the valley and the lakes. To our right a long slope flanked by small mountains. At Basin Pond we rested. Ahead of us, beyond one more ridge, were the main peaks, the connecting knife edge, shrouded in fog, three and a half miles in all. Up another dry stream bed, small pines, little patches of snow. We threw snowballs. We could see our breath, and my ears kept closing as in an ascending elevator. Cold. Reached Chimney Pond a glassy, smooth, sand-bottom pond. Near it, lean-tos and two bunkhouses. Across the pond, wet, black, vertical ridges sliced up into the fog with punctuations of white, white snow patches at intervals. Took photographs. We'll send you some when developed. Saw smoke coming from one of the bunkhouses. Knocked, and Ranger's wife greeted us. Good-looking young girl with a strapping six-month-old baby girl. She made us tea, and we talked an hour. I would have loved to spend a night in one of the lean-tos and completed the climb to the summit, but we had not taken our sleeping bags or provisions, and so back down the trail in much faster time than we tenderfoots had ascended. The next day, we drove from Millinocket to Bangor and back to Trevitt and Booth Bay Harbor. Hyde and I expect to go back to Katahdin in September for a week before we return to New York. A later letter, on September 8th of that year, King Bush returns to Katahdin by himself and says he hopes to be on the mountain from Thursday morning until Monday or Tuesday noon. And he adds, I guess I'm already in love with Katahdin. Hope to do some good work. He returns from Katahdin on September 14th and writes, I'm dashing off a line to say Expedition Katahdin No. 2 was a complete success, but definitely on the rugged side. 
When I finally started up the trail, I figured my pack must have weighed around 60 pounds. And did I sweat? I puffed and panted and staggered forward and rested and staggered some more. About two and a half hours later, I arrived at Chimney Pond, looking up to the summit. I arrived at Chimney Pond. Looking up to the summit is like standing on a tiny patch of football field and looking up 2,300 feet to the edge of a gigantic football stadium. From almost any angle, Katahdin is the most beautiful mountain I've ever seen. Seven o'clock the next morning, I was awakened by the sight of the sun rising. Blue skies, wonderful day, and I set out two sandwiches, three Milky Way bars, compass, iodine, and camera. Climbed up along the cathedral trail and finally hit the gentler ascent to the summit and arrived around noon at the top of Baxter Peak. Could see out to hundreds of lakes and mountains, an incredible moon landscape of water and endless forests. After lunch, I climbed along the knife edge, a narrow, rocky path, very steep off one side and more gentle off the other. Finally arrived at the summit of Pomola Peak and then started down the, the ridge of Pomola. Very rocky, huge boulders, and I hopping like mad. Well, the sleeping bag sure felt good that night. Sunday, I took a short trip to the North Basin where from a knoll covered with blueberries, I could look back and see the entire panorama of Katahdin and the Great Basin. Did some sketching and took photos. Monday took another trip down to Basin Pond, and then next morning came down and headed home. I wouldn't have missed the trip for the world. It was a wonderful experience, and I hope I can paint some pictures. Like that one. Would love to see Katahdin in the middle of winter in the snow. This trip I saw two deer, many snowshoe rabbits, and some marvelously beautiful woodpeckers, and a hawk. Love, Bill. This painting included here is one of the results of that trip in September 1948. It was in his first show at Crashar Galleries in New York in 1949, and was purchased by his sister Millicent, my aunt. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. If, if you wouldn't mind if anybody has any questions for a few minutes. Sure, I'd be happy to take if anyone has a question. Or